Chris Fink, and through no fault of my own, I'm the uh, chair of the Department of English. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the program that we have tonight. And then my colleague Sean Gillen is going to introduce our presenter. So, Tom McBride here. I've been waiting for him. I haven't seen him come in. Be on the lookout for him. Um, it, will be, it will be our pleasure tonight to hear a reading from Scott Russell Sanders, one of America's leading essayists, memoirists, and environmental writers, and holder of the 2014 Blake Howes, Lois, and William Willard Mackey Distinguished Professorship in Creative Writing. Uh, before my colleague Sean Gillen introduces Professor Sanders, however, I'd like to give you some history of the Mackey program, as it's called, which is in its 26th anniversary year. Since 1988, 24 literary luminaries have held residence at Beloit College, teaching classes, giving readings and lectures, and taking part in the daily life of the campus and community. The Lois and Willard Mackey Distinguished Professorship of Creative Writing was established by the late Willard Mackey, Beloit College class of 1947, in honor of his late wife, Lois. Bill Mackey enjoyed a brilliant career in advertising in New York, and Lois loved literature and was an enthusiastic reader. I'm told that uh, she was a fan of, uh, had a little better taste than her son, um, and was a fan of the Pulitzer Prize winner Larry McMurtry. Her memory and Bill's lifelong dedication to Beloit College and to the value of creativity led to the founding of the Distinguished Writers Program, which we're celebrating tonight. Those among us who can't resist a good love story, and that should be just about everyone in the room, will be interested to know that Lois and Bill Mackey first dated in Beloit, Wisconsin at Beloit College on December 7th, 1941, an important day in American history, when both were Beloit College freshmen. As they were leaving a restaurant in downtown Beloit, they learned of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Some months later, Bill was overseas in the United States Marines, serving in the Pacific Theater, where he became a decorated veteran, while Lois continued her study as an English major at Beloit. Lois graduated in 1945, and Bill returned after the war. Um, and among other things he did at Beloit College was to edit the Beloit College Roundtable, and he completed his Bachelor of Arts in German in 1947. Lois and Bill were married in 1948 and he had three children. Barbara, William, and David, which we'll, we'll, uh, I'll introduce in a moment. But I, uh, at dinner tonight, um, uh, I learned from uh, um, Willard Mackey's son, David, that uh, he has collected some letters uh, from his parents over the years. And I've heard, I've heard some sob stories from Beloit College students about how they can't come to class because their boyfriend's sick, or their boyfriend needs a ride somewhere, or their girlfriend, this and that. Here's a letter from, uh, uh, from um, Willard Mackey to his, uh, his wife, his wife at the time. Uh, this is uh, Tuesday, May 15th. Were they married at the time? Fiance, excuse me, fiance at the time. Uh, May 15th um, in 1940, must have been 1945. And so if you look at the handwriting, the first thing you notice, this is atrocious handwriting. This is not the handwriting of a boy college student. And then you find out that uh, he's right-handed, and he's writing this left-handed because he's been injured in the war. So all you students who make excuses to me, listen to this. Darling, he says, left-handed. I'm sorry I haven't written you sooner, Lois, but this is the first time I've been able to. I was hit the 10th, but I'm not seriously hurt. He was seriously hurt. Take note of that. It's called stoicism. <laughs> I was hit the tent, but I'm not seriously hurt, and I'm now resting very comfortably, not comfortably, in a naval hospital. As you can guess from this scribbling, I am writing left-handed. I was hit by shrapnel, by a grenade in the, left, in the right forearm. But don't worry, it isn't very deep. I always hear the opposite. You know, I see these little cuts, and it's like, oh, it's deep. This is stoicism. It isn't very deep, just bad enough so I can't use it for a while. Enough about me and my worries. 
About three days before I got hit, I got a whole slew of letters from you. And also a couple of pictures. Sorry to say, they were all lost. No Facebook. They may turn up yet. I can't remember now just what they were all about, but they sure meant a lot to me up here on the lines. You aren't going to hi-hat me when you get that diploma, are you? She's about ready to graduate from Boyd College, and you can tell from the, from the context what the expression hi-hat means. You aren't going to hi-hat me when you get that diploma, are you? You old intellect, you. Tell me about yourself, Angel, and don't worry. I was very, very lucky. Don't forget that God had me by the hand. My eternal love, Bill. And this is sent from a, 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 a Marine Base Hospital in the Mariana Islands. Somewhere in the Marianas, he says. Not quite sure where he is. It was a beautiful letter. Um, uh, and just another great Bloyd story. Um, so, um, Willard Mackey, who uh, f founded this chairship, is, uh, uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, his, uh, um, his uh, children and uh, grandchildren who um, carry on the tradition. So, uh, David Mackey and uh, his daughter Dana and his sister-in-law Annie Builder are here in attendance tonight. And I'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized for the continued stewardship of the, uh, the program their father and grandfather created. Thank you. Fred Burwell is going to be jealous that he doesn't have this letter in the archives. Someday, maybe. Yeah. We are grateful today for the call to action Bill Mackey delivered in 1987. One wouldn't necessarily think that creativity and the life of the imagination would be in danger at a liberal arts college like Beloit, but Bill Mackey, war hero, rightly perceived the threat bureaucratization and sophistry posed to creativity at Beloit. He presented a speech on creativity in the Liberal Arts College to the Alumni Council that was as timely today as it was in 1987. And though I never met the man, both the manner and the manner of his speech convinced me we'd get along just fine. Bill Mackey stated, I've got a bone to pick with Beloit and the entire liberal arts academic community. I believe creativity deserves a far higher priority than American liberal arts colleges including Beloit, are giving it. I'll say that once more. I believe creativity deserves a far higher priority than American liberal arts colleges, including Beloit, are giving it. We are grateful today for the call to action Bill Mackey delivered in 1987. Like the Mackey writers I'm about to list, and like Einstein, among other great thinkers, he believed that imagination trumps knowledge, and in that spirit, endowed Beloit College with this tremendous gift. The litany of past Mackey chair holders reads like a dream syllabus of contemporary literature. Imagine being in this class. Since 1988, Beloit College students have studied under the lights of the following literary luminaries. Raymond Carver, Tess Gallagher, William Stafford, Ursula K. Le Guin, Rick Bass, Carolyn Kaiser, Peter Mathiasen, Edward Hoagland, Denise Levertov, Amy Hempel, Lee Young Lee, Ron Carlson, Bay Dow, Patricia Hempel, Pam Houston, Billy Collins, William Least Heat Moon, Robert Stone, Richard Bausch, Linda Gregerson, James McManus, Giles Foden, Kevin Young. And this year, we welcome Scott Russell Sanders back to Beloit College for his second Mackey Residency. Scott Russell Sanders was a resident, uh, the Mackey resident here in 2009. And when he arrived to campus this time, he said, I'm grateful Beloit College gave me a, a second chance. He said, I hope to do better this time. In reality, he's been uh, one of the most uh, beloved uh, and respected uh, uh, Mackey professors. And uh, you know, besides the great tech classes he's taught, he has uh, written letters for former students to help them get into grad school and uh, has been in touch with them. And uh, basically, uh, based on the sort of uh, response from students, he's back here by popular demand. So uh, my colleague, Sean Gillen, will introduce uh, Scott Russell Sanders.
Good evening. Last week, Scott Russell Sanders accepted my invitation to speak with my creative writing students, a nonfiction writing class. The class meets at 10 a.m., and Scott came in on a Thursday morning, uh, not long before last week's storm, pulled into town and gave us another six inches of snow. Mackie chairs have visited my class off and on for the past 20 years, and the visits usually begin this way. I wait for the esteemed writer to find my office, or I find him or her finding my office. Then we touch base about what will happen in the room, and the writer, not always, but often enough, asks me when he or she can exit the room, and can I please make sure that happens promptly. So, last Thursday, my students filed into the room, and I waited for Scott first in my office, and then with increasing anxiety, in and out of my first floor office and into the courtyard of WAC. 10 a.m. passed, then 10.05, and then I went back to my office and fired off an email to Scott, reminding him of the room where we were meeting at the time. I decided I was going to walk into my room, and I did, um, to tell the students that we would start once he arrived, and, or we would begin and I would switch what we were doing uh, when he came to the classroom. Well, I walked into the classroom, and there Scott was, sitting between Stephen and Rachel at an angle that wasn't visible from the hallway. He had his coat off, and already knew who some of the students were by name. He was talking to them about writing, I think, in the warm tones that I've learned characterizes every exchange he has with a member of this community. You know, I was gonna begin my introduction about him, but then I realized, I went up to my students, that they already knew who this man is. I mention all this uh, because Scott's unassuming presence in my class epitomizes to me the kind of teacher, essayist, mentor, and man he is. Scott's career as an essayist and fiction writer extends through 20 books and countless essays and stories, including A Private History of Awe, and a conservationist manifesto. The best of his essays from the past 30 years, or 20 years, um, have been collected into Earthworks, which was published in 2012 by Indiana University Press. Um, also, just while he was here, his most recent book, um, The Divine Animal, has been published, and I believe many of his books are available for sale at the end of the reading in the back of the room. There will there'll be no uh, Q&A from the podium, at least, um, after the reading tonight, uh, but I believe Scott will hang out for a while afterwards if, if you have questions um, uh, and want to meet him. Among Scott's honors are the Landon Literary Award, the John Burroughs Essay Award, the Mark Twain Award, the Cecil Woods Award for Nonfiction, the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana Authors Award, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2012, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and he's a professor emeritus from Indiana U University, and as you know, a two-time holder of the Mackey Chair. I think to his credit that, that at first glance, Scott's life work can be difficult to contextualize. His work spans an era, I'm just talking about non it's nonfiction now, that will be remembered, I think, as one of the most important in the history of American nonfiction prose. You know, writers that he's sort of written and published alongside include Joe Dinian, Tom Wolf, Richard Selzer, Selzer, Edward Hoagland, Barry Lopez, Annie Dillard, and even some of the younger contemporaries like David Sedaris and David Shields. Um, I think, you know, when I look at many of these writers, Scott's work is among the most human of all their voices. And I think for most Americans, and my guess is for many people in this room, the most profoundly accessible. He doesn't write out of a sense of negation or from an aloof literary circle or from the literary salons of New York or from the most elite universities or English departments. He doesn't write from the inner circles of celebrity or political culture. He doesn't send us missives, missives from Tibet. And if he did, it wouldn't read like a missive from Tibet. He's an environmental writer, if there is such a thing. But his writing on nature doesn't try to shame us or terrify us with Jeremiah about the end of the natural world, or he doesn't encourage us, you know, what are the proper products to buy. Instead, and I, and I believe many of you would feel this way if you, if you read his work deeply, you'll, you read him and you discover that you are, in fact, an environmentalist, that you care, in fact, deeply about the world. Uh, Scott Russell Sanders takes on many of the hardest subjects in an era in which many nonfiction writers barely differ from the producers of reality TV shows. He writes about how to lead a deeply enriching life by staying put in one's home how to understand the legacy of an alcoholic father who could work with wood, how to keep a marriage together over the decades. In fact, you know, to quote him recently from an interview about his essay on marriage, Scott said, it's a lot harder to engage people in reading about something that works well over a long period of time 
than to engage them with something that breaks down in catastrophic and sensational ways. I don't want to say too much more about Scott's work because you will soon understand why Scott Russell Sanders is among the only Mackey chairs to hold this esteemed position twice. Uh, you'll understand why his students here and throughout his career value the man and his work. And you'll understand why you braved the cold wind tonight to hear the generative cadences of his prose. Please join me in welcoming Scott Russell Sanders to Beloit. Well, thanks to all of you for indeed braving the cold. I came up from southern Indiana for this residency, and nobody told me you were going to have the worst winter in 30 years here. So it's been a great joy to be here. I'm grateful to Beloit for inviting me back. I'm grateful to the Mackey family the parents' generation whom I never had a chance to meet, uh, the children's generation whom I have had a partial chance to meet, grandchildren's generation whom I've also met one representative of. I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to President Bierman, uh, to Provost Ann Davies, and to all the faculty, especially in the Department of English, who have welcomed me into their classroom. And I am grateful to my students, whose company and writing I am very much enjoying. When Chris Fink invited me to come back, it didn't take me long to decide to say yes, because I had had a very enriching time when I was here before. A warm reception, wonderful students, very interesting and committed faculty a beautiful campus, and so I was very happy to come back and glad to be here. I'm going to read two kinds of things to you. First, an essay, Useless Beauty, the slide you see on the screen, and then, depending on how our time goes, three or four tiny fictions. As I talk with my students in the workshop about writing essays, one of the things I've discussed is that ex essays are often driven by questions, not by answers. There's a certain kind of writing which is delivering what you already know or what you're already convinced of and you want to convince other people of. And there's a use for that kind of writing, but the essay, as I practice it and as I enjoy reading it, is inquisitive. It's experimental, it's looking for things, it's trying to figure things out that the writer doesn't understand or doesn't understand as well as he or she would like. So this essay, Useless Beauty, is really driven by two questions. One, why is there so much beauty in the world? Human-made beauty, but also cosmos-made beauty, nature-made beauty. Why is there so much of it? And the other question is, what does that beauty and the abundance of it require of us? What does it ask of us? And actually, since creativity was brought up in the quotation from Willard Mackey, to what extent does our creativity express the very same impulse, the very same patterning power that produces beauty like that, that half shell of a chambered nautilus. Well, let's see. Here's where those questions led me. In a niche above our hearth, alongside books and rocks and bird nests, my wife and I keep the shell of a chambered nautilus. My mother bought it for us at a flea market more than 30 years ago, thinking we might welcome a reminder of the ocean in landlocked Indiana. Like the shell of a lowly snail, and like our galaxy, it has a spiral shape. When the Nautilus was in residence, it would have floated with the knobby core of the spiral uppermost and the curving tail pointed down. 
as large as a saucer and thinner than fine porcelain, our shell has been sliced down the middle in such a way as to produce two symmetrical halves, which we display side by side, one half showing the exterior and the other showing the interior. On the outside, wavy stripes, the color of butterscotch, radiate from the center of the spiral, contrasting with an ivory background which is faintly grooved as if from brush strokes and glossy paint. The lustrous interior reveals a sequence of chambers resembling crescent moons, 30 in all, which the Nautilus fashioned as it grew, beginning with a cranny too small to see without a magnifying glass and increasing step by step to the size of a child's grin. It's, as, it's a marvelous feat of construction as if a baby fashioned its own cradle and then having outgrown that first home went on to make a crib a bedroom, a hut, a cottage, a mansion, and on and on through its entire life. Over the years, visitors have often admired the shell. Many ask if they might look at it more closely, and I'm always happy to reach the two pieces down from their niche and lay them in curious hands. The visitors run their fingers over the tigerish stripes in, on the exterior, tilt the half shell to catch the sheen of its pearly interior, examine the spiraling chambers. They marvel at how a deep sea animal could produce such elegant patterns and captivating colors. Some visitors go further and ask a question that the Nautilus shell has long posed for me, not how this beauty is produced, but why? Why such beauty in a seashell? For that matter, why such beauty in a sunset, in blossom, or bird song, or butterfly wing, or anywhere at all. Once you allow this question into your mind, it will be followed by a host of others that philosophers have pondered for ages. What is beauty? Is it an, an intrinsic feature of the world, like the mass of an apple? Or is it an artifact of human perception, like the apple's red color? If beauty is an aspect of reality independent of our perceptions, how does it arise? Purely by the operation of physical laws or by design? If by physical laws, how do they happen to generate a quality so pleasing to us? And if by design, then who or what is the designer? Whatever its nature and whatever its source, why does beauty appeal to us so deeply? Why do we crave it? Why do we savor it and seek it out? And why do we strive to create beauty with our hands and minds and voices? Despite having devoted thousands of pages to these questions, philosophers disagree about the answers, as they tend to do about all the perennial human puzzles. As an amateur, I will leave the great enigma of beauty to the experts and merely reflect on the small piece of the puzzle which I stumbled across while reading about the chambered Nautilus. According to scientists, the pattern on the outside of the shell, which we find so lovely, provides camouflage from predators and prey. The wavy butterscotch stripes thick and dark on the portion of the shell that floats on top gradually fade as the spiral opens, leaving the bottom portion clear. Seen from above, the stripes obscure the outlines of the shell and blend into the darkness of the deeps. Seen from below, the unmarked ivory blends with light from the surface. That we find these markings gorgeous is a happy accident. What seems beautiful to us is beneficial to the Nautilus, a legacy of evolution, helping its kind survive for some 500 million years. But what about the shell's interior, that mother of pearl luster, that exquisite series of crescent-shaped chambers, all invisible to predators? This beauty gave no benefit to the Nautilus. Indeed, it sealed its doom, for the only predator that knew of this hidden splendor was the two-legged kind that fished the shell from the sea and sliced it in half and introduced it to the marketplace of beautiful objects. Although of no use to the Nautilus, this interior beauty has kept the fragile half-shells intact as they passed through innumerable hands, including my wife's and mine 
and those of our many curious visitors. Among the things in nature we find beautiful, many, like the outer pattern on a nautilus shell, are the result of natural selection, adaptations that improve the chances of survival for an organism or a species. Think of the peacock's tail, attractive to mates. Think of the monarch butterfly, its cautionary orange and gold, or the day glow colors of rainforest frogs, warning of the poisons they carry. Think of the zebra's stripes, confusing to predators, or the scent of roses alluring to pollinators. Consider the chameleon's shifting colors, the courtship dance of sandhill cranes, or the daredevil flights of woodcocks, the flicker of fireflies. All can be explained as resulting from natural selection. You could discover as many examples as there are living species, for if you carefully observe anything alive, you will find something biologically useful that is also beautiful. In addition to that useful beauty, however, you will discover something more, an extravagance of design, an opulence of materials, like the pearly interior of the Nautilus shell. It serves no evident purpose other than to make the natural world inexhaustibly interesting. If you study flowers, for instance, you will find quite a few that seem fancier than they need to be. Look at fuchsia with its blossom of purple pantaloons overtopped by a pink tiara. Look at bleeding heart with its plump valentine blossoms dangling from the stem like charms on a bracelet. Look at iris with its streaked petals flung out in all directions like the blurred arms of a whirling dervish. Or look at wild columbine which might be a scarlet moonlander with five spurs thrust skyward like spiky antennae, five pointed sepals spread out like wings, a white interior for a firing chamber, and yellow threads of stamens shooting downwards like the tracery of rockets. If color, odor, and beckoning shape are the key signals to pollinators, why all the flare and filigree? The same lovely extravagance shows up everywhere we look or listen in the living world. From the dazzling pattern of microscopic diatoms to the sea-filling arias of humpback whales, the wings of butterflies known as painted ladies resemble the stained glass on Tiffany lampshades, a fanciful collage of swirls and curlicues and eye-shaped spots. There are fish gaudier than clowns salamanders flashier than neon signs, medusas like alien spacecraft, birds as flamboyant as Victorian Easter hats. Look wherever you like at monkeys or mushrooms, cacti or dragonflies, fritillaries or ferns, leafhoppers or leaves, and you will discover designs more various than any vocabulary we might use to describe them. Even if this seeming excess of beauty could be accounted for as biologically useful, what of the glories in the non-living world? What of sunsets and sunrises? What of the northern lights? What of the moon, our fellow traveler, which is, with its captivating phases? What of the stars, those faithful muses? What of the sea with its troughs and swells, its rhythmic drumming on the shore? What of canyons and crevasses, waterfalls and glaciers, the play of current in rivers, the restless ballet of clouds? There's useless beauty everywhere, even among seemingly stolid rocks. In the limestone country of southern Indiana, where I live, for example, our creek beds are littered with brownish lumps of mineral sediment called geodes ranging from the size of peas to the size of basketballs. They are dull on the outside with little to catch the eye, but if you split one open inside, you will find translucent crystals of quartz or bands of purple amethyst or orange agate, pale blue chalcedony or sultry red jasper, colors and forms as resplendent as anything a jeweler could make. 
our remote ancestors paid heed to such earthly and heavenly glories, painted them on the walls of caves, wove them into religions and rugs, etched them into stories and stones. In the past few centuries, however, our ingenious technology has revealed beauties from realms our early ancestors knew nothing of. Telescopes, microscopes, cameras mounted in satellites or in undersea submersibles, receivers capable of reading the whole spectrum of light and sound and a slew of other devices have greatly extended the range of our senses. If you graduated from childhood without having looked through a microscope at the menagerie of beasts in a drop of pond water or through a telescope at craters on the moon, you were deprived. More powerful instruments reveal even more astonishing designs. The compound eye of the ordinary house fly viewed through a scanning electron microscope might be mistaken for the head of a sunflower or a geodesic dome. At higher magnification, the facets of that eye look like hexagonal pastries crowded onto a baking sheet. Undersea rovers have photographed luminous creatures more exotic and majestic than anything conjured up by the makers of science fiction films. The Hubble Space Telescope has brought us mesmerizing close-ups of our sister planets and of our own precious globe. Peering into distances that stagger the imagination, the Hubble has also brought us images of quasars, supernovae, black holes, and other spectacular phenomena that were unknown even to astronomers a century ago. Moreover, thanks to computers, data banks, and the World Wide Web, you can summon up such revelations in your home, school, or library, or through a gadget that will fit into your palm, images that were hidden from every previous human generation. Everywhere we look, from the dirt under our feet to the edge of the expanding cosmos, and on every scale, from atoms to galaxies, the universe appears to be saturated with beauty. What are we to make of this? If you believe that so much stunning design can only be the work of a cosmic designer, then the designer must be inordinately fond of beauty. It would seem to follow for anyone who holds such a belief that this beauty is sacred to the designer and is therefore deserving of our greatest care. We can't protect the glittering stars or flaming sunset or cycling moon, but we can protect streams that salmon need for spawning, the high plains where sage grouse dance, the ancient forests required by spotted owls, the Arctic calving grounds of caribou. We can defend the last groves of redwoods from loggers, the creeks and mountain tops of Appalachia from miners, the ocean floor from trawlers, the atmosphere from polluters. On the other hand, if you believe these ubiquitous beauties can be accounted for entirely by the operation of material processes, you may nonetheless treasure them. Indeed, you may treasure them all the more as gifts we have no reason to expect from an indifferent universe. You may feel an obligation to protect whatever falls within your reach, not because it is divinely created, not because you can eat it or wear it or display it above your hearth, but because you love the beautiful thing itself, a creature, a species, a place. Even if you happen not to marvel at salmon or wolves, even if you've never seen an unplowed prairie or an unlogged forest, you might still favor the protection of these and other natural beauties out of a respect for the people who do know and love them. Or you might take a third view of these matters a view that will long since have occurred to the philosophers in my audience. You might argue that what I call beauty is not a feature of the universe at all, sacred or secular, but only a quality of experience, a certain inner weather like sorrow or joy. Even on this view, if beauty is merely a label for a feeling, that inner state is so enthralling, 
so invigorating, so nourishing, you might wish to protect whatever source outside of consciousness gives rise to it for your own sake and for the sake of others who could enjoy the same experience. If it thrills you to hear owls call from a deep woods, you want the woods and owls to survive. And you want your own children or other people's children or children yet unborn to have a chance of feeling the same thrill you felt. Whatever our philosophical or scientific or religious views, a close attention to beauty in the natural world ought to inspire in us an ethic of ecological care. It ought to make us live lightly. It ought to make us ardent supporters of laws aimed at protecting air, water, soil, endangered species, and wilderness. It ought to, but frequently doesn't. Those who regard beauty as only the name of a pleasurable feeling might find all the stimulation they desire in movies or music or mathematics without recourse to nature. Those who regard the universe as a machine that has been grinding away for billions of years without purpose or direction might regard natural beauty as having no intrinsic value, but only as a commodity to be used up or discarded to suit our appetites. Those who believe in a beauty-loving creator often claim, based on a literal reading of the Bible, that the universe is only a few thousand years old and that everything in it, on earth and beyond, was created for humans to exploit, a mere backdrop for the drama of us. Our collective behavior suggests that the dominant view, at least in America, is that nothing in nature has value except insofar as it is useful to humans and useful today, not in some future generation. What good is a wilderness if we can't drill it for oil or mine it for minerals? What good is an ancient forest if it doesn't yield bored feet? Why protect wild salmon if we can grow fish in concrete vats laced with chemicals? Why worry about any non-human creature if it stands in the way of our plans? Measured by its consequences, the utilitarian ethic has proven to be disastrous. A child born in America today enters a world chock full of human comforts and contrivances, but sorely depleted of natural wealth, topsoil lost, rivers damned, air and water poisoned, wetlands drained, roadsides and oceans littered with trash, resources squandered, species extinguished. We are trading forested mountaintops for cut-rate electricity. We are swapping the sound of meadowlarks and the sight of prairie coneflowers for casinos and parking lots. We are sacrificing rainforests for hamburgers, coral reefs for island cruises, glaciers, for SUVs. With every upward tick of the gross domestic product, the richness and resilience of the greater than human world declines. Of course, that same child born in America today may never know what has been lost. She may take the diminished world as the way things must be if we are to enjoy what Madison Avenue and Wall Street call progress and prosperity. With each passing year, Americans on average spend more and more of their time inside human constructions, buildings, vehicles, symbolic zones made out of numbers, musical notes, or like this essay, made out of words, and inside the trance of TV, video games, and the burgeoning empire of cyberspace. Cut off from direct contact with natural beauty, people make do with crude substitutes, with tokens, such as flowers and vases, flowing water and fountains, and nautilus shells above the hearth. If those counterfeits and borrowings are all we know of nature, then natural beauty is in jeopardy, for we will not protect what we do not know. The final look at the interior of our Nautilus shell suggests a possible way out of this impasse, a way of reconciling the world we have made with the greater world that made us. 
By compressing nitrogen into those inner chambers, the Nautilus can regulate its buoyancy, ranging in its seemingly fragile hull from the shallows of tropical seas to depths of 2,000 feet, nearly 10 times as deep as a scuba diver could safely go. More intriguing, the pattern of crescent-shaped chambers illustrates a mathematical rule first described by Descartes called a logarithmic spiral. The formula can be written out in a string of symbols shorter than the title of this essay. The same pattern appears widely in nature, in the bands of hurricane winds, in the spiral arms of galaxies, the array of seeds and sunflower heads, the shapes of certain broccoli heads, in a hawk's curving approach to its prey, even in some wave-scoured beaches. This congruence between nature and numbers does not lead me to conclude with Pythagoras that the universe is mathematics writ large, but rather it persuades me of the opposite, that mathematics is the universe writ small. Indeed, this consonance between the patterns we make and the patterns we find in nature reinforces my sense that not only mathematics, but also music, poetry, painting, photography, storytelling, dance, all forms of art and symbolic language are manifestations through human beings of the cosmic penchant for creating beauty. The universe out of which we have evolved is inscribed in our intelligence and imagination. This does not make us gods, nor does it justify our dominion over earth, but it does confirm that we belong here in spite of what other worldly religions claim. The creative genius in nature runs right through us as it runs through the chambered Nautilus. I will let the philosophers define what beauty is, but I think I understand some of what beauty does. It calls us out of ourselves. It feeds our senses. It provides standards for art and science, for language and literature. It inspires affection and gratitude. How then should we live in a world overflowing with such bounty? Rejoice in it, care for it, and strive to add our own might of beauty with whatever power and talent we possess. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. These are two-page stories. I'll read three or four of them. I'm collaborating with a dear friend of mine, Peter Forbes, you see his name there, who's a wonderful photographer who lives in Vermont. Uh, and we're making a book together with Peter's photographs on the right-hand page and an entire story of mine inspired by Peter's photograph on the left-hand page. So it has to fit in two columns. So that gives me a nice, clear boundary of length. It's, they're about 600 words, six, 700 words. And a lot of writers in the room, and you know that's not much space. So, uh, and this is a photograph of Peter's at his farm, his and his wife's farm in Vermont with a uh, pond in the middle. And I use the same picture as the cover for my new novel. So each of the stories just has one photograph. This first one is called Run. Papa lets me catch him when we race along the beach. I know he's just pretending he can't outrun me, but the racing makes me forget. Wind brushes my face and waggles my pigtail. I go so fast, sandpipers skitter out of our way. Seals pop their black heads out of the waves and stare at us with eyes as big and round as plums. Eagles chitter at us from the sky. The wet sand rushes by under my feet. Across the strait, the snow-topped mountains blur. 
When I grab Papa's shirt, he tumbles down with a whoop, and I tumble on top of him. I hook my fingers into his hair, smush my face into his springy beard. Slow poke, I say, nuzzling his jaw. He laughs. I laugh. The air shakes. Then he grabs my waist and lifts me up and spins me slowly around. Where is North? This is a game we play as if I'm a compass needle. I point where I think North is and he says, right as rain, and sets me back on his chest. His heart thumps against my cheek. I look across the water watching for whale spouts and I see the mountains are still again. If you'd worn shoes, Papa says, you'd never have caught me. It's true, my bare feet go faster than my feet in shoes. But you're barefoot too, I say. Fair enough, looks like I'll need to grow me some wings to keep ahead of you. As if he has called the birds, gulls waddle up to us, cocking their heads left and right, checking to see if we're something they can eat. Eagles swirl over the mouth of a creek waiting for salmon. A puffin flaps by, dangling silvery fish from its beak, most likely herring. You have to see a puffin to believe it, like if you stuck a parrot's head on a penguin's body. This beach is our secret island where Papa hunts deer. It's not secret from the whole world. Friends live here and let us use their cabin when they're away. Our boat isn't big enough for heavy seas, so we ride to the island only on calm days like today. Every time we come here, I think this is the best day ever. Oh, there's a spout. Humpback, I yell. I roll off Papa and stand up. Another spout, maybe a calf. Papa unfolds his long legs and stands beside me, his hand on my shoulder. We watch, and a big fluke curls out of the water, then a little one, a mother and a calf, for sure, feeding in the kelp. On our way home, Papa will lower his microphone into the water so we can hear the whales sing. Let's look for critter sign before the tide scrubs them out, I say, tugging at Papa's beard. We dawdle along the damp sand, bending over tracks. I name ones I know, deer, otter, marten, mink, and then the prize one, bear. Clear as day, wide front foot and long hind foot, each with five round toes and pointy marks from claws. Papa whistles, we follow the bear. We see where he stopped to dig, where he clawed at a drift log, overturned boulders, sat down with his legs splayed out in front of him like a kid in a sandbox, then where he tromped back into the woods. I stare into the forest, thinking about the deer hiding there. Papa doesn't let me go along when he shoots them, but he lets me help them help cut them up. The first time I sliced through the brown fur, I felt sad. But Papa thanked the land for giving the deer and thanked the deer for giving us food, and I felt better. One day, the worms and bugs will eat me. This makes me sad, too, because I like being alive, but that day is far, far off. Suddenly, I need to run, so I holler, race you back to the boat and take off. Papa gives a yelp and follows. I can hear him puffing, hear his big feet slapping the sand, but he won't catch me. You don't need to, you don't need to, you can, if you feel like clapping, you can clap when I finish the last tale. They're just a little short tales, okay? So here's the, here's the next one. This is called Trash. Somewhere in Central America, probably Costa Rica, it's crazy what people throw out, stuff you can use, stuff you can sell, stuff you can give to a bigger street kid to buy protection. Me, I'm 11. If I keep living, and if this scrawny body of mine ever puts on any meat, one day I'll be a bruiser myself and won't need nobody else to cover my back. But for now, I gotta pay or get the crap beat out of me. How big I'll grow, who knows? Word is my padre was a drifter there one night and gone the next. Nobody got a good look at him. All my madre could remember about him was he smelled like sugar cane. My madre was so little a wind would knock her over. What did knock her over was a mudslide. She and our hut and half the village got buried while I was out rounding up our goats. So I sold the goats and came to the city where, like I say, people throw out stuff you wouldn't believe. The hutch 
I built under a bridge has a door with hinges and a window with glass and a camp stove with pots and a wooden box full of clothes and every bit of it I picked up on the street or at the dump. Nobody messes with my hutch because on the door there's a cross with Jesus on it painted by this amazing artist who's in the gang I buy protection from. If I could paint like him, that's all I'd do. But I can't draw for nothing. What I'm good at is finding treasures in trash. Like, you know, those ballpoint pens made with clear plastic. I find them in gutters and waste baskets on shop floors. The ones with ink in them I keep for myself so I can write my life story someday. The empty ones I sell to other kids for making blowguns or beads. And you know those gadgets that quit working and get tossed? Phones, toasters, vacuums, music players, electric toothbrushes. Well, I take them apart and sell the metal to the recycler. He don't pay so much, but about all I need money for is kerosene and cigarettes. I'm fixed for clothes and blankets. I wash them in the river and mend the tears with safety pins or needle and thread. Shoes with the soles worn through hold up good when you stuff cardboard inside. Food I get from bins and alleys behind bodegas. You slice off the mold, pour on salsa, it tastes fine. My best find lately was a heap of tubes from bicycle tires, enough to fill my grocery cart. Actually, it's not my cart. It's on loan from a store across town, a glitzy place the size of a cathedral. They won't miss one cart. Anyway, I was poking around behind a bike shop when I opened a box and out jumped a snarl of black snakes, only it was these tubes, prime rubber, not even any patches. I asked around the barrio, could anybody use some bike tubes? One lady bought a few to sew into wallets and purses. Another bought some to weave into doormats. Folks thought up a hundred uses, sandal straps, bungee cords, chair seats, handle grips, hammocks, tie downs, boot laces, you name it, and plumber even snagged some for wrapping around leaky pipes. I kept one tube for myself, sliced it into strips, made me a belt, which comes in handy on these baggy pants I've scavenged. Made me a watch band, no watch yet, but you never know when somebody might get tired of their old one and chuck it. I wrote five o'clock on a piece of paper and glued it on my watch band. It's right twice a day. 5 a.m. is a good time to check out the dump. The rats are finishing their night shift, rats big enough to lasso and saddle up, and the garbage trucks aren't growling yet. 5 p.m. is another good time when business is slow enough for pawn dealers and scrap buyers to to bother with me. Uh, none of this is stolen, hey kid? They ask, giving me a wink. They don't need that wink. The things I borrow, like this grocery cart, I always give them back in as good a shape as when I borrowed them. I never steal. God said, don't do it, and I don't. You won't catch me stealing, and you won't catch me throwing anything useful away. This is called conscience. I thought I was a good man. After all, I was a faithful husband, a loving father, a deacon in my church. I coached Little League Baseball, served on the boards of charities, donated generously to good causes from my earnings as a realtor. If a friend was in trouble, I helped him out. If one of my relatives fell sick or lost a job, I sent a check. When my parents grew too feeble to manage their house, I moved them into a condo. And when they grew too forgetful to manage the condo, I moved them into Birmingham's finest nursing home. In light of the values I had learned while growing up, I considered myself, as I say, a good man. Yet something nagged at me a voice whispering that my dutiful life was deeply flawed. Call it conscience, if you will. 
When I was a child and was troubled by scary thoughts, my mother told me to imagine they came from a devil who sat on my left shoulder while a comforting angel sat on my right. Listen for the angel, she urged me. The whisper I began hearing in my 40s at the peak of my business career lost my place. At the peak of my business career and as it turned out of my reputation as a pillar of the community came from neither shoulder but from my heart. It was an ache as much as a voice. I noticed it first while ushering at church one Sunday when a family of Negroes, as I had been taught to call them, showed up at the door. A father and mother and two children all neatly dressed. What to do? I couldn't turn them away but I explained that they might feel awkward as the only people of their kind in the church. The father said he wanted his children to see how white Southern Baptists worshiped. So I led them to a pew at the back of the sanctuary where they would be least noticed and from which they could swiftly depart after the service. Through the hymns and prayers and sermons, I told myself that I had acted properly with due regard for the feelings of this Negro family, but a contrary voice from within told me I had acted shabbily. I should have welcomed them in and invited them to sit wherever they pleased. That voice became more insistent, not only in church, but also in my real estate office at the country club and in bed as I lay brooding. How can you be a good man, the voice demanded, while you carry the mental stain of slaveholders? How can you be a good man while hiding out in an all-white world? Over a quarter of Alabama's citizens and over half of Birmingham's are black. You see black people every day on the streets and in stores and restaurants. You sell them houses, but you guide them into all black neighborhoods where banks offer loans at inflated rates. You sit next to them at lunch counters Stand near them in line, but rarely do more than nod hello. Blacks are excluded from your country club, as they are from your church, not by official rules, but by long custom. Those few who serve on boards with you disappear from your thoughts as soon as the meetings end. Most shameful of all, no black person has ever entered your home except to clean, make a delivery, or perform some other service. Like your ancestors, you have clung to this purblind way out of fear. Fear not so much of black people about whom you know little as of whites. If you violate the unwritten code, what will your neighbors and customers and kinfolk think of you? Will they kick you out of their clubs, ruin your business, shun you and your family? Maybe so, but you'll have to run that risk if you wish to live in peace with yourself. I'm far from being at peace, but I'm closer than I was before I began hearing that voice. I imagine it coming from the center of my chest, from the lips of a man who is about my age, his chocolate skin still smooth, but his hair beginning to gray, his eyes peering solemnly through spectacles, my double, my shadow, a man who sees both sides of this poisonous divide, bearing a history of grief that I have only begun to fathom. And I'll read one more. Let's just show you two pictures in between because they're in the sequence. It's called Topsy Turvy. It's called Stars, and this is what I'll close with. It's called Wind. There is a man who reads the wind. As other people learn of happenings near and far by skimming the newspaper or watching television or surfing the web, so he learns of events by taking in air through his nose and mouth and the pores of his skin. He, may, he marks the onset of spring from the aroma of thawing mud and the onset of winter from the scent of snow. 
He recognizes flamenco contests and football matches from the tang of nervous sweat. In the same way, he knows when plumerias bloom, when loaves of bread come out of the oven, when lovers couple, when a pregnant woman's waters break. The man has not always been able to read the wind. As a young boy, he scarcely noticed the restless air. Then at the age of nine, child of a poor family, living far from doctors, he lost his sight to disease. In the bewildering darkness, gradually his sense of touch grew keen so that his fingers discovered the texture of things, the slick of a worn coin tossed at his feet, the freckles on a friend's cheeks. Then his hearing sharpened so that he could detect the wing beats of dragonflies and the fall of tears. Finally, roused by the darkness, the sister's senses of taste and smell took over from his blighted eyes the burden of knowing. No one edits the wind. It hides nothing, invents nothing, tells no lies. So the man gathers revelations that never reach the screens or pages where others glean their news. Coffee poured from a pot, gasoline pumped from a hose, diesel exhaust, coal smoke, fresh laundry on clotheslines, mashed bugs on windshields, damp clay on potter's wheels, wedding bouquets, funeral wreaths, pollen from trees, sawdust, flaking rust, muddy boots, wet stone, nothing escapes him. Because wind courses over the whole earth, the man receives bad news as well as good, often more than he can bear. He smells raw sewage along with roses. He smells the rot of bodies dumped by roadsides as well as the must of leaves decaying into soil. Before squad cars arrive at the scene of a crash, he knows of the accident from the stink of scorched rubber and shredded steel. Whiffs of burnt gunpowder alert him to the latest shooting and reeking explosives announce the outbreak of war. The stench from shanty towns appalls him. And so does the funk of unwashed bodies huddled under bridges and the sickly sweet exhalations of starving children. While he was still able to see, he could shut out grief by closing his eyes. But now that he reads the wind, he can no longer withdraw, not even in sleep. He could seal himself in a room, bottle himself up in stale human air, but that feels like a second blindness. So if he must be indoors, he leaves the windows open and at every chance he goes outside. Because wind tells the truth. It keeps him from forgetting the greater world on which the human world floats like foam on the sea. He can trace the migration of cranes and geese, smelling on their wings the hint of tundra in the fall and the muck of southern swamps in the spring. He smells the saltwater breath of whales, the salmon breath of bears, the syrupy flow of maple sap, the marshy slosh of the tides. In the land where he lives, the prevailing wind is westerly, but on any hour of any day, it can wheel around to north or south or east, fickle and feisty, willful, wayward, even when leaves hang motionless from every branch, when hair lies flat on every head, somewhere a breeze is rising, a whirlwind is forming, a gust is about to blow. The man wears his own hair long, so the currents of air can flirt with it, hair as black and surly as a thundercloud. Facing into the wind, head tilted back, he imagines himself a moat of dust, whirled about, dancing for a precious moment. When strangers notice his shut eyes and ask if he needs directions, he replies that he knows exactly where he is. Thanks very much. Thank you.
beautiful. Uh, thank you. Not useless. A uh, special night. Uh, books for sale in the back. The author will uh, uh, sign your book if you'd like and if you would like to have a word with him. Thanks for coming. Thank you.